Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 485. And a big welcome back. The summer break is over. Queen Elizabeth II just died. But the pod is back on tap and we've got a corker to begin with. My name is Minter Dial, and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the Evergreen Network, please visit evergreenpodcasts.com. First, before I introduce my guests, I'd like to give a shout out and thanks for putting up a five-star review of the show on Apple Podcasts by Jay Shinwald. So this week's guest is Bernard Marr. Bernard is an internationally recognized speaker and business strategist, a best-selling author, and advisor to global companies and governments around the world. He's a renowned futurist who writes regularly for Forbes and is one of the world's most successful social media influencers at the intersection of tech and business. In this conversation with Bernard, we discuss his book, Business Trends in Practice, overall winner of the Business Book Award 2022. We'll look at the scope and ambition of the book, some of the key business skills that leaders will need, including good citizenship, innovation, creativity, and of course, interpersonal skills. We examine the qualities of, and the need for resilience, authenticity, and ethics. A most stimulating tour. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com and please do consider dropping your rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Bernard Marr, what a pleasure to have you on my show. You and I, uh, at least I've been following your work um, over the years. You're a prolific author, best-selling author, obviously of highly influential um, and we met last at the Business Book Awards 2022, where not only did you have two books that won the category awards, you also had the book that won the overall Business Book Award. Congratulations for that. It's a, uh, it was a great, great uh, evening. And, and obviously, you were won the sweepstakes, per se. In your own words, Bernard, how would you like to describe yourself? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you so much for for having me. Um, I find it really difficult to describe myself because I do so many different things. So I and and when I start explaining this, people get really bored. And for whatever reason, um, the the title futurist seemed to stuck, and pe- people seem to like it, and they seem to understand what I'm doing. So I'm looking at future trends uh, in business and technology. I write about those, I consult about those, I work with companies helping them to understand what those changes might mean for their industry and for their business and how they can prepare themselves for it. I work with leadership teams to help them understand how they can prepare themselves and their workforce for the future of works. And I do keynote speaking and I obviously write write books I write for Forbes I've got my own podcast I've got my own social channels so if I start to explain this this is pretty boring so I, I think a futurist is even though I don't particularly like that word I, I think it's probably the the simplest explanation it's always good to have it one word at least it it, it, it you, you we can always then qualify it afterwards as opposed to sort of having this mashup of, of different things and i think that's some things that i also uh, struggle with tell us bernard how did you get into this position as a futurist what was your path into it was it a, you know to, to be a singular person able to to produce so much i think like with so many of us you somehow fall into this or you grab opportunities that come come along i i studied um two degrees in germany a mixture of uh, technology so engineering and it and business studies and that was a pretty new degree combination um and 
at, when I came to the end of my degree, my professor in Germany had a relationship with Cambridge University. So he then said, do you want to go there and write your dissertation there and finish your degree there? So I, I grabbed that opportunity. I thought this is wonderful. And I've had just the best time there. I loved Cambridge, just being able to cycle to the university every morning and, and having the freedom and space to, to write and research. And I got integrated into this research center there really well. And the professor I had was a real role, role model for me, someone that that was connected to business, someone that was writing books. So I then, um, at, at the end of my dissertation, which went very well, they then offered me a job. And I thought, this is great. I, I can I have to find a job and I can put Cambridge on my CV. So I then became a research fellow. Then my the centre I was working for, they moved from Cambridge to Cranfield School of Management, another world-leading business school, purely postgraduate, working with lots of brands, helping them, doing a bit of consulting work, funded research. So this suited me much better because I never really saw myself as a, a true academic as such. And so I then um, worked at Cranfield School of Management for 10 years and the university there was very good to me they gave me basically two days a week to do my own thing so I could build my own consulting portfolio and um, and then the the writing side just started because everyone in academia writes articles and writes books and if someone told me 20 years ago that I would be writing books I wouldn't have believed it and it just started naturally. First, you write articles, and then someone says to you, do you want to write a, a chapter for my book? And then you think, this sounds super exciting. I do that. Mm -hmm. And then I I edited my first book because once I wrote a chapter, I thought, this is actually not that difficult. It's quite exciting. And I would like to do my own book now. And then I, when you edit a book in academia, you then find other authors to write chapters for you. And then I realized actually quite a few of those chapters I would have done differently. So I ended up co-writing quite a lot of them with them. And then I thought, actually, I, why don't I just write the whole book? And, and my first book was a more academic book. And then I thought, actually, I want to do more mainstream work. And then at some point, this was really my my real passion came out that I wanted to write real mainstream books in, in business. And my first area that I was looking at was business performance management. So I looked at strategy and how company use data to inform decision making at a strategic level. So I looked at KPIs and, and performance management frameworks. And this then became, um, so this whole space of analytics almost merged with this space. So KPIs became much wider, companies looked at a wider data set, and then the, the big word big data emerged. So I wrote a book on, on big data. And, and then I started writing for Forbes, uh, and I found this much more interesting than writing for, for my academic journals. So I then, my, my emphasis shifted to the mainstream writing, and then at some point I thought, actually, I don't need the university anymore. This is just distracting from what I actually want to do. So I left and then concentrated on my own writing. I then, um, and... Initially, my writing on Forbes was all about data and analytics. Then this whole field of data and analytics became artificial intelligence. And then artificial intelligence, I wrote a book on this. And this then has so many, um, it impacts so many other fields. So you, you then think about it has an impact on blockchain technology, on other emerging technology, on extended reality. So I, I, I wrote about how AI is enabling some of those and then I became really interested in all of this and, and then you look at other trends like cloud computing and quantum computing and how this might um, enable the AI of the future and and so I, I then branched out and wrote about 
various technology trends. And then I, I wrote my first book on, on tech trends in practice, which looked at the 25 biggest technology trends. So this was my most mainstream book at that point when I looked at, okay, cloud computing, quantum computing, extended reality, metaverse, all these mega trends, blockchain, but also nanotechnology and gene editing. So some of the, the, the more interesting, innovative um, technology trends. And then I, when I worked then with businesses on technology trends and strategy, it became clear that this is all intertwined with business trends. So I then wrote my book on, on business trends and practice in which I wanted to look, look even wider. And, and this is how it all came about. And, and now I, I write about business trends and technology trends in the widest sense. It's a wonderful arc, your, your, the way you describe it, and it just makes total sense as you've come along. Question for me, or the, as I'm listening to you, is at what point did you have a tipping point in the, in the following that you have? You've, you've accumulated such a massive following. Was there a specific moment, a book, um, that, that, made, that just added in you know, the... Uh, hundreds and thousands at the day where where how does that happen uh, for you so to be true really honest i don't really know exactly how it all happened um so i i, I think as a person i'm quite risk averse so when i was thinking about leaving the university setting and doing something for myself I wanted to have as many followers as possible and connections and people on my database that might give me some work in the future and 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 might want to buy my books and so on so this this was the starting point and i wanted to share as much of of my knowledge that i have and my my thoughts and so i i was really active on twitter at that point um and was getting a few hundred new Twitter followers a day. So that was going really well. And I was linking my Twitter to my LinkedIn. And at some point, LinkedIn must have picked this up, thought this is this guy is doing something interesting. So I got, I got an email from LinkedIn saying that they are setting up this um, influencer program. And they've picked the 200 or initially just the 100 most influential business people in the world and I was one of them so at this point I actually thought this was spam because I mm -hmm. they they had Bill Gates and Richard Branson on the list and then good old me so I thought this is just crazy and then they rang my office so I thought okay maybe this is there's some something in it and then I started writing for, for LinkedIn. And this really, at, at that point, it was only 100 people of us writing. Um, now every, everyone can write, but at that point, you couldn't. And I realized I could write an article, and then they would push it out, and suddenly 20, 30, 40,000 people would read it. And this was super exciting. Um, and then I wish I had a I would have realized the power of this a little bit earlier because I would have put as much effort into it as I do today. In the beginning, I wrote one article a week um, and I would have written three <laughs> if I knew how powerful this all was. But that was amazing. And then, and then it just snowballed from there. Um, I then built up a really good following, then LinkedIn wrote out newsletters. Um, that was another really big milestone for me because what happened to normal publishing, because then the platform was open to everyone and pretty much if you post something, it gets lost in, in the noise. And what um, the newsletters allowed me to do is to have my articles delivered into people's inboxes. And those I now have 1.2 million newsletter subscribers, about 2 million social media subscribers. And it is just very humbling and I love it. And, and I, if I write something now, I can guarantee that 150,000 people will actually read my article, which yeah. is lovely. I don't blame you. Fantastic work. How do you manage your social presence? I mean, you know, when you, when I talk to individuals who have millions of followers, 
And for someone who has just, you know, pe peanuts for followers, it's a very different game. The number of people who are reaching out to you, and uh, do you have to delegate your social media at any point? Uh, how do you decide where you participate and, and where what you ignore? Because you probably, you know, I assume you have some people who say something negative on occasion. Mm. What, what, what are the, what, what's your sort of guiding principle? Yeah, so I managed everything myself for a really long time. But then at some point, you just, you haven't really got all the time in the world to put the email newsletter together. So there's, there's sometimes you miss a week. And I had a pretty good setup. I, I was using a, a number of tools that would allow me to schedule social posts. So in the beginning, I would just... Um, I don't know, have a, a Google alert set up on some of the key trends. I would read some of those and then share them and schedule this all in for the week. Um, nowadays, I'm super lucky that, that people come to me with exclusive stories so I can pick and choose what I want to write about, which makes it a lot easier. But at some point, I thought I, I need a bit of help. So I, I have a, a small team that now helps me to make sure everything gets scheduled in so if i want to share something i send it to them they then draft something i then approve it and then it gets scheduled in and they help me to to schedule some of the posts um some of my podcasts and 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 live streams i now pre-record and schedule them them in so i've just tried to work a bit more intelligently and in terms of negative comments i mean touch wood I've been pretty lucky <laughs> until now. There was a time when there, when there was one person that really didn't like me and tried to put a negative comment on pretty much anything, and I just never responded. So at some point, he just gave up. Um, but I, I think this, this comes somehow with the territory, um, that you have to expect this. And somehow you have to have a thick skin. You just ignore it. And um, one of the platforms that I'm trying to put a lot of effort into and trying to grow is my YouTube channel at the moment. Again, something I would, I wish I would have done differently. I think 10 years ago, people said to me, you need to have a, a YouTube channel. And I don't think I felt confident, confident enough to just get myself in front of a camera and record it and, and put myself out there. But at some point I thought I really need to start doing this. My first videos were horrendous, but now it is growing really nicely. So I I've have found a way of getting a good balance between interviewing some interesting people and also getting my own, con uh, my own content out and, and sharing this. And on YouTube, I, you get more of it. You get some negative comments. So I remember I was interviewing um, the chief technology officer from Huawei about 5G and suddenly wow. this just exploded. <laughs> and I had to, but the good thing is you have tools so you can turn off comments, you can delete comments and this normally solves the, the issue. Well, I mean, if you have millions of followers um, to have one or a couple of comments, negative comments is it's really small. And, and I think the way I've looked at your writing, you're not exactly controversial in the way you write maybe having someone from Hawaii is controversial because of their <laughs> politics, but um, it's not about you per se, but let's now talk about your, the book that, that won the overall award at the, the business book awards, your business trends in practice that published it's published by Wiley. What, um, what struck me about this book is it's such a wide scope. I mean, it's really covering so much from, uh, whether it's uh, different technologies, uh, different trends, the, the global shifts and dem demographics, and uh, and obviously the business trends. I, w what a daunting list of things to try to cover in one book. And so the question as a fellow author is, how on earth did you structure it? How did you, what was the organizing principle you used? Yeah, so, so for me, when I was planning the book, I actually thought this is the book. This is the one book I will ever write that I would be really proud of because I work with so many different companies and so many different leadership teams across the world. And I saw this pattern of the same issues emerging. So I wanted to put all of this into one book, which is 
super difficult because the book could have been a million words long. So because each of the issues are so long, I, I think one, what I always try to do is to make it, bring it or explain it in a way that anyone can understand it. So I want to make it simple enough at the same time, um, really relevant. So I, I thought about the, the structure very carefully and I thought let's, if we start outlining some of the biggest shifts that are happening in the world. So my, my first part is about how the, the, the biggest socioeconomic shifts are taking place. So our, our planet is hurting. This is a big thing we need to tackle. Economic powers are shifting around the world. China's becoming more powerful. India will rise. There are some African countries that will come up that will challenge the US and Europe. There are some serious issues around polarization around the world where um, politics from Brexit to Donald Trump to others are dividing the world rather than bringing it together. Then there are some serious demographic shifts that are taking place. People are getting older. Uh, a completely new younger generation is entering the, the, the world of work with completely new expectations. There are cultural shifts. So I try to lay this out. Then my then I wanted to say that technology obviously is, is a huge transforming element of our world at the moment. So we have, uh, people talk about this fourth industrial revolution that we are in at the moment. And um, I, I don't know whether this is the, the right term to use anymore because all previous industrial revolutions were basically driven by one technology. They were driven by, by water Hunting press or yeah so they it was electricity it was um um steam um it was computing now we have so many different technologies we have blockchain we have artificial intelligence which i believe is the most powerful technology humans have ever had access to we have um more immersive technology augmented virtual reality we have uh, 3D printing, they're all it by themselves completely revolutionary. So what I think is happening is that we've entered a, a new phase of this hyper um, innovation where the, the speed of innovation and especially innovation driven by technology will just accelerate and keep getting faster because we can now, they're all influencing each other as well. So if we look at gene technology and synthetic biology, some of the things we can do there is enabled by AI and, and enabled by quantum computing where we can now discover new drugs and do amazing things and edit our genes and potentially completely change what it means to be human. Then we have amazing technology around smart robotics, which again means we can 3D print replacement body parts for us in the future. So they're hugely transformative technologies. And, and I wanted to outline the, the top 10 of those and how they will impact the world. And then that laid the foundation. And then I, I felt I needed to talk about some of the sectors that I, I feel will be completely transformed. Some of the main sectors, some of the main industries. So I talk about energy and given what is happening on our planet today, we need to find new energy solutions. We need to decarbonize. We need to digitize this whole energy world. Uh, we need to decentralize it. Then I want to talk about health, uh, a huge challenge, huge inequalities in the world around access to health but also huge opportunities to make our world a better place to democratize access to healthcare using technology and making it more personal and better. Then I, something I'm really passionate about is education and how we learn. Um, I've got three children that are, uh, my oldest one has just finished her GCSEs. Um, I've got a, a younger one. So 16 years old for those who yeah, are not, not in England. Exactly, 16 years old. And then I've got two boys. So my daughter is 16 and then two boys, 14 and 10. And I'm also a, a, a governor in, in their school. So I, I see it from the inside. And I get hugely frustrated by the, the way our education system is currently set up and, and, and delivered. And I, I think... 
we need innovation in this space. We need to completely transform how we learn because um, our education system was set up for the first industrial revolution where we just front loaded all of this learning at the beginning of their lives and then <clears throat> expected them to enter the world of work and, and have all the skills they need and never, never having to relearn anything. This has completely changed. The half-life of skills in this hyper-innovation world <clears throat> is rapidly decreasing. That means the skills I learned today will be pretty relevant in a, in a few years' time. So we need to continuously learn. Having this growth mindset will become hugely important for anyone in, in, in work. And then I look at how we feed ourselves, another huge challenge around farming and, and food supply chains, and again, linked to sustainability, how can we feed our world that is, is growing so rapidly, we'll have uh, 8 million people very soon, um, 8 billion people very soon on the planet. And we can't just feed them in the way we do at the moment, where we use huge parts of this world to rear animals and then we have even larger parts to grow crops that we then cut down turn into food for the animals ship it to the farms feed to the animals they then produce huge greenhouse gases in in in, in the process then we slaughter them and we send them to supermarkets we could cut a lot of this out by just eating more vegetables and and plant-based food and, and insects <laughs> And insects is a huge opportunity, absolutely. Um, right so, yeah, so I, I talk about that and, and all the business opportunities that come with all of this. And then I talk about how we make and build things, so manufacturing, construction, industry, how we move people, so the whole transport infrastructure, and so on. And then, so I wanted to paint the picture of how transformative all of this is at the moment across all industries. And then the third part of the book is all about what does it now mean for businesses in terms of their product and services? How do they need to rethink what they're offering and how they're offering their products and services? So I talk about making things more sustainable, more intelligent, and more immersive. They are, for me, the, the three key trends here that I'm seeing. That sustainable, we need to... Um, look at everything we do and have more we, we consumers are becoming more conscious about everything from food miles to to carbon emissions and so on so this is something we need to look at um, and then intelligent is about using data and ai to make our products and services more intelligent more personal more right for the for any moment um, and then more immersive is for me this ne next evolution of the internet we're now talking about the metaverse or web three so web one was static websites web two was the participative internet with social media instagram TikTok. the next evolution of the internet will transform the, the way we experience the internet make it more immersive so instead of looking at static websites we will have holograms we will have augmented reality we have virtual reality where we can immerse ourselves in it and make it much more real and for me the simplest example is if you now google various dinosaurs you now have the option of putting the dinosaur um, into your room so you can use your phone and, and this is something that is still mind-blowing for lots of people when I first show them. And this is something anyone can now do. So if you take your phone, go on Google, look for Tyrannosaurus Rex or whatever you want to search up, and then you have the option of putting it as an AR into your room. Augmented your, reality. Yeah, into, into your garden. And this, for me, you can read about it, you can look at a photo of it, but this augmented reality representation on your phone gives you the scale because it will scale it in the actual size it is moving you can then walk around it and look at it and this for me is just a very tiny small example of how the internet will become more immersive in the future and and part of the this evolution of the third internet is not only that our 
interface will become more immersive, but also will become more decentralized. So we'll use blockchain technology to, and, and NFTs and other things to, to make it more decentralized. And, and <clears throat> that is a, a super interesting evolution. So, and every company needs to be ready for this to make their products and services more sustainable, more intelligent, more immersive. And then the fourth part is, okay, what does it now mean for our businesses? And how do we get ready for this in terms of making our own processes more resilient and more sustainable? How do we find the balance between humans and intelligent robots and machines? This for me is a hugely important question for every organization because machines are now able to do pretty much anything. So how do we get the balance right? And um, how do we make sure we give the jobs that are best suitable for to humans, to them? How do we retrain our workforce? Because it will, AI and robotics and all these transformative technologies will augment all our jobs. So we need to get ready for that. And then we need to make sure we keep, find and keep the right talent. Our world is changing so much. We You can now recruit pretty much people from anywhere in the world, especially when they're able to work from home. So what does that mean? How do you create the right work experience for them? How do you create the right organizational culture? How do we then organize our organization into more flatter, more um, less hierarchical and more agile organizations? This is another challenge I see in lots of organizations. And then how do we become a more authentic organization and an organization with a real purpose? And then the, the last part of the book, I take a, a brief look into the future and say, okay, what does it now mean? And, and where do you go from here? And so for me, it was like everything I've ever learned and known and, and think is really relevant today, I tried to put into one book. And when I won the award, which I absolutely did not expect in the slightest, I could not have been less prepared for that. I was so humbled and, and so excited. Hello, I'm Paul Brandis, host of the new Evergreen podcast called West Wing Reports. Each Friday, I'll recap the week's highlights from the White House, Capitol Hill, Pentagon, and elsewhere. I'll feature the news affecting you, your money, your job, your life, reported fairly and accurately, as well as interviews with some of Washington's most intriguing people. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. One book, one word. Wow! <laughs> well, that is quite a run through. And um, as I was listening to you, I, I kind of felt like you have to be the master of the universe to, to, to read it and be able to apply all the things that are in there. Did you have a specific reader in mind as you read it? Or is it sort of more like this is this is the future and this is the world as I see it and hopefully you can I can bring some people along on the ride. Yeah, for me, I I think that that I wanted to make this book as widely relevant as as I could. So I think for most of my books, my target audience is an a, a business executive is a, a senior leader in an organization who wants to understand some of the key trends. So when I talk about artificial intelligence and big data and extended reality, these are not technical books, these are business books. <clears throat> and But then I also find that lots of technical people love those books because it gives them the application, the use cases, it enables them to talk about, talk to a business audience and to their own leaders in a completely diff different way. And, As opposed to the geeky IT person who kind of is sort of really embedded in code and doesn't know the application and the business context. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I, I think sometimes when you work on, on AI, <clears throat> on artificial intelligence project or blockchain projects, you can get completely bogged down in the detail. And this is where your headspace is. And I think in order to make these projects happen in, in organizations, you need to be able to lift your head above this and say, okay, this is where this is all going. These are the opportunities. And um, and and for business leaders, it's really important to understand the, the wider trend. So this book is really for anyone, anyone who is interested in a 
in, in, in the business world, which hopefully should be most people because they, they have jobs in, in, in a business or in an, in an organization. And this is equally relevant to, to, to government organizations or um, private companies. They, I, I think I, I wanted to paint a picture that is relevant for anyone really, whether you're just starting your career, whether you're in school, whether you are a business leader. At the end of the book, uh, Bernard, you, you write that this book really is all about resilience. So I, I'm trying to think of what would be for the business executives, the, first of all, how does one make oneself and an organization resilient in your mind in today's context with the work you do with clients? What is it that they need to do in order to be more resilient? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and for me, the fact that we are now in this world of hyper information where transformation will happen faster and faster. If you, any of the industries I've talked about earlier, they are seeing such a vast transformation. And I, I feel super lucky that I work really in businesses across most industries. So one day I work with um, uh, like a sports company like Manchester United or, or McLaren Formula One racing. And then the next day I work with a company like Shell in the energy sector. And then I work with a, a, a big bank or insurance company. And they are all seeing their industry being completely transformed by some of the key trends like sustainability the making things more intelligent getting ready for the metaverse and and other things so for me resilience means finding the right balance between being prepared which means you need to plan you need to understand what is happening and how you will tackle the future at the same time having um, the ability to be flexible and continuously adapt and and change your plan so in the past businesses had 10-year plans and they what happens now is that organizations have they might have 10 years plan 10 year plans but hopefully three year plans which are more relevant and and then they revise them every six to 12 months to make sure they stay relevant so then there's no big surprise coming along because if you're a bank ai and big data have completely transformed your world cloud computing has transformed your world now blockchain will transform your world so there's so many trends that they need to respond to in an agile and adaptable way so when i work with organizations one of the things um, we put in place is what i call a plan on a page so we create a one page strategy plan that outlines what they want to achieve the key goals in terms of customers the key things they need to do internally and the key enablers then they need to get right and this is such a powerful tool because you can then use it to articulate to everyone in the organization, as well as external stakeholders, what your business is trying to achieve. And to some extent, you have to be quite a brave leader to do this as well, because it means you, you put your you put it down into words, you print it, or you put it in, di in a digital format and say, this is now what we're trying to do. At the same time, you then put mechanisms in place to review this on a regular basis. So every six months you say, okay, how do we now need to tweak this? To make sure it stays relevant and and for, for me that this balance between being prepared and being adaptable and being this resilient organization in the future means that oh, for, for, for sustainability is a hugely important component of this if if we don't address sustainability in any aspect of our business the products we make uh, the contribution we make to our world the the way we produce things and sustainable in the widest sense not just the environment but also social socially that we are basically addressing some of the biggest challenges we see in the world this 
is part of sustainability because if we don't then we will destroy our planet in the long run and in the short run businesses will not survive because consumers will become much more conscious and and business partners will and investors will become much more conscious about who to invest in where to buy from so in in, in this i I feel the need to, to talk about values and authenticity. Um, I also need to make one comment, which is something I, I sort of, I had an aha as I was listening to you. Actually, this book needs to be read by every single governor of every board that's operating. Because I do not believe that in the governance side of things, boards are equipped uh, or conversant in sufficient number of these elements and technologies. But it, when it comes to establishing what's sort of immutable in a company that, that normally would be values and this idea of authenticity that you talk about and presumably even the purpose of the organization, these, mm -hmm. these are some immutables that you talk about at the end of the book. Yet, is it hard to in the face of so many different trends and moving pieces, keep an eye on what needs to stay in order for us to be called authentic, values-driven, purpose-driven organization. Yeah, so for me, this is this should be your 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 they, they should be your guiding principles and they're so important that they should see through some of the biggest trends and they should help you if you have a purpose and you are authentic they should help you find the path for your organization through all of this change that is happening and that will increasingly happen in the future and for me authenticity is something so important and it comes in two different on two different levels it comes as as an organization where we need to develop trust i think trust is a hugely important ingredient for any organization in the future if you think about um just one example that data now is one of the most important business ingredients one of the most important business assets that that companies can leverage in, in so many different ways. If, if consumers don't trust your organization, they won't be sharing data with you in the future. And in the future, there will be many more ways to control personal data, especially when we think about blockchain technology and Web3 technology. And, and companies that don't build this trust will simply have no access to those resources and to the data. And for me, authenticity also is as simple as being reliable and respectful as an organization and have good products and to be transparent. For me, transparency to some extent helps you build trust. And again, coming back to the data space, what I'm seeing at the moment is that lots of companies are still trying to collect as much data as they can by hiding this in page long terms and conditions that nobody ever reads and they know that they won't read it and they so it's, it's a sneaky way of getting to this information in the future this will become much more difficult and for me authenticity also is part of leadership um, I think especially younger generations uh, I, I think in the my generation older gen, older people they they can be quite cynical they realize that people turn up at work maybe with a different persona um i think in the future this will not be possible people want to see the true self of you of a leader um i think in the past what we've seen is that some people almost had two different personas one at, at home and or in their private life and one at work and i think this is merging together where we want more authenticity we want leaders that are self-aware that that are vulnerable that um, are able to say I I don't know this but let's learn this together um, uh, and that, that have a really strong moral compass compass I, I, and have lead with empathy and honesty 
and those are the leaders that that will be successful in the future that people want to work for and I, I think everyone can see through fakeness and I, I feel that the younger generation now is less tolerant of fakeness than maybe what we were in in the past and which leads me to to purpose so for me this is something that organizations need to get right they need to understand what their purpose is and I, I think in this book I give enough hints of what some of the biggest challenges are that we're facing in the world and if you can hook your purpose into some of those huge challenges that we're facing because any challenge for business is a huge opportunity because if we can tackle climate change and the health inequality and the education challenges and all of these things that we have the the way we, we create food the companies that are succeeding at the moment are the ones that are tackling all of these challenges and and ultimately what you want is you want to have an organization that will help to make our world a better place and and this for me starts with purpose i so agree in in my last book i had to talk about that sort of personal professional space or divide i i refer to it in my life as moving from the tie to the tie dye which i would wear um, in my evenings uh, watching the grateful dead and so it was about merging those to have them blend perfectly as as one person in terms of authenticity one of the obviously this is a topic i'm familiar with of course some things you can't say so transparent 100 transparency is is not even possible and the the thing i'm getting to is how do you measure authenticity because if you can't measure it then how do you get it so to speak do you do you see any clients who actually have measuring sticks on authenticity or is it just something that people talk about <laughs> it's a very good question and i i, I think when we talk about measurement, I mean, this is, this is, this is my background. I, my dissertation was on how do you measure some of the more intangible elements of, of our world. And, and sometimes we mistake measurability for numbers, something we can count. And, and the thing is that if you think about customer satisfaction, I can, I can measure how many customers turned up and how much they spend. And all these things are nicely measurable. But then I ask them, how likely are you to recommend us to a friend? Which is a very subjective feeling that we have. But then we can turn this very subjective feeling into a number by giving, us a, giving us a 10-point scale. Yeah. Um, and so for me, authenticity is very similar to that, that we all know when we work for someone that we feel authentic and when we connect to a company and buy something from a company, we feel they are authentic and transparent. And so we, I think it's less about the numbers and it's more about how it will make people feel. And this will be we can then look at surrogate measures around staff satisfaction and loyalty and and, and, and customer satisfaction and loyalty. And, and, and for me, authenticity will play an increasingly important role in all of this. So we can measure it, but maybe we haven't developed the right tools yet. Um, which is when you ask the question, I, th I thought, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity here for us to develop a tool. A bit like when we talk about the different levels of intel or the different types of intelligence. So we've always, we have for a long time had an, an, a measure for our intelligence, for our cognitive and, and uh, analytical intelligence, which was an IQ test. Um, then people realize, okay, this is not enough. We need to look at maybe emotional intelligence as well. And then we de develop lots of tools there to, to measure it. So maybe there's an opportunity for anyone listening to develop an authenticity measurement tool. Or maybe there's already one out there that I don't, I'm not aware of. Well, I, I've thought about this quite a, a, a lot. And I think ultimately it comes down to knowledge of self, awareness of self. And the, for me, the misguided element in authenticity is trying to pretend to be someone we're not. 
And, I couldn't and, agree I, more. and so it sounds authentic. We're being transparent. Look at me. But actually, I don't really believe it or I don't know myself as a leader. And then that will spill out into the ill effects into the you know, bigger audience. Very true. Last um, zone, because um, or time is of the essence. I want to talk about purpose. And uh, in, in you, you very clearly spelled out how you would like to see purpose be tied into the bigger socioeconomic issues of our world, uh, whether it's um, climate change or poverty or health uh, access and so on. And, and you mentioned Novo Nordisk, um, Nor Nordisk uh, the Danish uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, which I know personally rather well since I, I use their insulin because I'm type 1 diabetic. And, uh, and interestingly, they, they write basically that their purpose is to make themselves redundant. So the cynical mentor, as I'm an older guy, as you said, I'm an older guy, I'm like, huh, that doesn't sound like a great business model. How does one go about um, managing profits in that purpose if my intention is to make myself extinct yes it's, and <laughs> Nova Nordisk is, is one of my customers and I've worked with them for a number of years and I, I've actually been really inspired by their organization by their leadership by their people by their culture and in the beginning, I, I actually helped them create a, a, a strategy framework as an organization. And, and when they said they wanted to put at the top of their, their, their plan on a page um, that they wanted to eradicate diabetes and until then make the lives of anyone with diabetes a lot better. Type two, generally, you, you yeah. talk about as opposed to type one. Yeah. Yeah, any, yeah. And what is, yeah, absolutely, yes. Eradicate the, the one that, that it's we- It's about obesity and lifestyle. We, we as opposed to the autoimmune yes. disease, yeah. Yes, but potentially both. And and so the, their research is trying to find ways to, to get rid of it, which is wonderful. So the, as you, the cynical one saying, is, are they really honest about this? Because they will have no business if this happens. Um, and, and maybe they realize that the word at the moment is going the opposite way. And even if they say it nicely, it's not going to happen very soon. But having worked with the, the people there, I have come to the conclusion that this is actually really the case because people working for Novo Nordisk are excited to come to work because of the purpose that they're helping people and they're making the world a better place. People generally are not coming to work to make more profit. And I've had this with a number of other organizations. I was working with another massive healthcare company, Takeda. And again, they, 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 that one of their biggest focus is, is cancer drugs. And again, when I, was working, when I was working with their leadership team on their strategy, again, what they were saying is that people in this organization come to work and they get up in the morning to cure cancer and find new drugs and make this world a better place. They don't come to work because they want to deliver greater shareholder return. And for me, if organizations get this right, then they put purpose ab above profit. And Apple for me is another interesting example because when, um, when I work with Apple on some of the strategic direction, again, what they decided to do is normally you have profit and financial performance at the top. And they decided to put customer satisfaction at the top. And, and something around their, their brand engagement. And they said, because if we get this right, profits will follow. And for me, this is, this is what every organization needs to really think about this very carefully. And you, you said the, the go governance of organizations in particular, they need to realize that if we don't have a purpose, if we don't deliver something the world needs and our potential customers need, then we will not have 
we won't make profit in the future anyway. We might do it in, in the short term, but definitely not in the long run. Yeah, um, I um, have written considerably around the idea of purpose. And I my pushback to the Apple approach, my wife worked for them and I obviously know them fairly well. And for, for general idea is that everybody has now figured out that the customer is reasonably important, that the customer pays the bills, that the customer can now go on and scream bloody murder on social media, write a horrible blog post and, and has a voice as opposed to being shut up by the system before. For me, the more advanced companies absolutely uh, will understand that purpose is the driving force. But purpose can't be, we want to be a customer-centric company like Amazon has written. And I think that's very short-sighted because the people delivering that customer experience satisfaction are the employees and the ecosystem around that. So the, the, the real driver is having a legitimate purpose like the Novo Nordisk um, purpose that then brings everybody delivering that service or product uh, to the market more excited, energized, and then they will get customer benefit. If it's if it's if customers first, I mean that's of course freaking customers first. Uh, we we all need customers. If you don't have customers, you don't exist. However, the really stronger, longer term vision ones are the ones that know that purpose is the thing that drives everything, which will include especially the younger generations, less cynical, who are willing to buy a product because of the purpose as opposed to necessarily just the product. Yeah, I agree. At the same time, I see lots of organizations that talk the talk in terms of customer first, and they, in their mind, it's about acquiring customers, making more revenue, turning into profit. And right. then, in, again, financial services is a great example. They, or, or telecom companies, they try to acquire new customers, get them on a contract, but then the customer service is suffering because they're trying to squeeze on out more profits and they're automating the wrong things. And suddenly as, a, as an end consumer, you can't get hold of anyone, you can't solve your problems, you get really frustrated. So there's still a huge scope to improve all of that. <laughs> That is for bad customer service. Absolutely. <laughs> Bernard, uh, we have come to the end of a, a lovely stimulating chat. Um, you've got a new book coming out. So I want you to tell us about that. And then we're going to sign off. Tell us of future skills, huh? Yes. So this, this, this book came about, to, to some extent, I started talking about some of the things I talk on the new book in, in this one, in, in, in business trends and practice. Because... One of the chapters is on how do you get the right balance between machines, intelligent machines and AIs and humans. And I talk about some of the soft skills that we will need because in the future, we'll be able to pass more of the mundane work, some of the more repetitive work to intelligent machines and humans can solve some of the bigger problems. They can add some real value in terms of what, what makes us truly human. And I basically every talk I gave when I talk about the capabilities of AI and the transformative powers of technology, people get scared and they say, okay, machines can now read, they can write, they can write computer code, they can write articles, they can compose music. Um, what does that mean for, for people? What skills will we need? Will we have jobs in the first place? And if we do, what will they look like? And <clears throat> so I wanted to write a book that really focuses on, on those things that, that people ask me about all the time. And I somehow wanted to write a book for my own kids to say, actually, this is how you get ready for the, the world of the future. Because sometimes when people talk about AI and data science, they think everyone needs to become a data scientist now. That is absolutely not true. Um, and I wanted to write a book for companies, especially for their HR teams and their senior leaders to think, okay, how do we reconfigure our organization? Because I think there's a real obligation that organizations have honest conversations saying, okay, robots are coming, AIs are becoming more powerful, 
how do we now reconfigure ourselves to to use all of this and my message in this new book is positive is is not about robots versus machines it's about actually let's give some of the jobs that humans shouldn't really be doing to the machines and make our world of work more human better for us so i looked at the 20 skills and competencies everyone needs to succeed in a digital world and there are some technical skills so i talk about the fact that digital literacy so some of the things we touched on today is becoming really important understanding what tech is out there and how it will impact your work I also talk about data literacy, so understanding the importance of data and organizations being able to turn it into insights without necessarily being a data scientist or an analyst, but generally have some basic understanding of all of this. Then we need technical skills in every job. We need to be aware increasingly of the digital threats, cyber security. But beyond that is all about the things that make us different from machines. So it's about judgment and complex decision making it's about critical thinking in a world where we have filter bubbles and an increasingly polarized media it's really important that people are able to find trustworthy information where our kids don't get the news from tiktok and youtube but they understand some of the the biases that come with information that that comes from these platforms. Um, we need to focus on emotional intelligence and being able to work in teams and collaborate well as part of this interpersonal communication. I talk about the importance of being able to work in, in gigs. So I believe that in the future, individuals will have a set of skills it will be less about them being employed by one particular organization but more in gigs where they work i think gigs within their own organization or across multiple organizations where they more fluidly go in and out of teams and and contribute with the skills they have i talk about things like cultural intelligence and and diversity consciousness this is becoming increasingly important ethical awareness good leadership skills but then also things like building your own brand will become really important in the future because people will i think the traditional job market where you apply people will then check you out on linkedin and if you don't have a good presence and if you want to become a leader in a, in a certain industry you need to develop develop your own voice and and start talking about what you believe in so building your own brand and networking is important, time management. I think one of the most important skills that I talk about in the book is having curiosity and having a mindset where you continuously learn and have this growth mindset as an, as an individual. And not being afraid of change. So you actually embrace and celebrate change. And then finally, looking after yourself. So finding a good work-life balance and looking after your physical and mental health, I think is increasingly important. So it's again, a bit like what I've been doing in, in business trends and practice, but for individuals where so I say, okay, how do you get now? How do you get ready for all of this? And what does it mean? So I talk about why all of these 20 skills are so important. And I point people into the direction of how do you then de develop those? Because I believe all of these skills, you can grow as an individual. Well, it sounds like I need to get you back on my podcast to talk about that one. <laughs> Bernard, oh yeah, do you do your kids have kid kidmar.com? um signed up yet <laughs> not yet <laughs> yeah so how can people who don't know you uh follow you uh find out your books is there a good uh, place that you like to send people to track you down or connect yes so i i would love to connect with anyone um a good way to do this is to go to bernardmar.com um my website where you can sign up for my newsletter but we can also find thousands of free articles, free ebooks, free reports um, on any of the topics we've covered today. Um, and then, of course, you can find me on all social media channels. So, if you, um, YouTube is a, a big focus of mine at the moment. So, I have a lot of content coming out there. Um, 
and and then of course linkedin twitter facebook and i have recently even started on 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 tiktok so, crazy man you crazy man i know <laughs> on, on tiktok is super interesting because um i wasn't i'm still learning but i i believe that the platform will change and when i told my kids they're going to be on tiktok they said this is so cringy dad you can't do that this is our platform and so i actually if someone wants to understand where AI and technology is at this point in time, have a look at my TikTok because the person you're seeing there is not the actual me. It is a an avatar of myself. So I work with an AI company to turn myself into an avatar. And what I now can do is I can simply type text into a platform. This then will create a video of me saying it in my voice. So I work with another company to create a synthetic voice uh, of myself. And this is pretty crazy stuff. So it gives you a really good feel of how, how far AI has come. <laughs> Apropos. Hey, Bernard, uh, I think my studio audience needs to give us a big hand. Big you, big hand. Thank you so much, Bernard. Uh, it was a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter you can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 or more blog posts on mintodile.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
Hello, I'm Paul Brandis, host of the new Evergreen podcast called West Wing Reports. Each Friday, I'll recap the week's highlights from the White House, Capitol Hill, Pentagon, and elsewhere. I'll feature the news affecting you, your money, your job, your life, reported fairly and accurately, as well as interviews with some of Washington's most intriguing people. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.